Good morning and uh, welcome to day three of the Autism Theology and Church Conference. Uh, I'm Denise Morden. I'll be moderating uh, this morning's session entitled Autism and God Representations. Um, I welcome our two uh, speakers who will be joining us this morning, Hanneke Skapjonka um, and Hans Schaefer, who um, I'll introduce in a bit more depth um, shortly. But just uh, a little bit of general information first. And if you've attended uh, some of the sessions already, um, you, you may have heard this before. Um, but if this is your first uh, time attending a session, you're more than welcome. Um, and I'll just go over a few reminders and general information. I think first and foremost, we want uh, this space here in this conference to be a safe space. Um, we've come to this conference because we have an interest in autism, theology and the church. And whilst we share that uh, commonality, we acknowledge that we all come probably from different places, different perspectives. We remember that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, those words from the psalmist. And as we hear the talks, reflect and ask questions, in some sense we are in a space that can be considered holy ground. So with that in mind, uh, please ask any questions or raise any comments um, in a respectful way. Um, abusive comments and questions won't be accepted. We want this space to be a place of mutual learning from one another. Um, and that requires vulnerability, sensitivity, um, and also respectful challenge. We also acknowledge that our trigger responses will be different for each of us, and probably even more so on, on day three of the conference where maybe our trigger responses are slightly heightened um, maybe as a result of having sat through some of the sessions already on previous days. Do take breaks if you need to. The sessions uh, will be recorded um, and the recordings will be made available um, at some point after the conference. Uh, please bear with us as they will take some time to be uploaded, but um, you will receive an email with the details when they are live and ready to access. So. Uh, keep an eye on that and on social media also. There's a Wonder Me room um, available and at the end of the session um, the link will be put in the chat um, to make it easy for you, you to find the link. Um, we ask that if you're going into the Wonder Me room um, would you uh, mind logging out of Zoom um, completely. There's been some audio um, issues that have affected the, the working of Zoom and um, the Wonder Me Room. Um, I'm not technical, I don't really know how these things work, but it seems to be resolved by logging out of Zoom before you go into the Wonder Me Room. Our session um, this morning will run as follows. So we'll have um, a talk from Hanukkah for about 30 minutes. Um, then we'll take a five minute uh, screen break to stretch our legs um, or do whatever you need to do in your five minute screen break. Um, then we'll hear a response from Hans um, for 10 to 15 minutes, um, followed by Hanukkah having the opportunity to respond to what Hans has said. And then we'll move into a 20 minute Q&A session. Um, if you could kindly place all your questions in the Q&A box, which if you're on a laptop is at the, the bottom um, of the screen. Um, we do welcome comments um, as well, but if you are making a comment rather than a question, um, if you could just start with your, your comment with the word comment um, and, and please um, also put whether you're happy for that to be shared with uh, the wider group or whether that's something you're feeding back to the moderators behind the scenes. It might be unlikely that we will get through all the questions, but we'll do um, our best. Um, if you'd like to keep your uh, question anon anonymous, there's a checkbox where you can tick ask anon anonymously. Um, we won't be revealed the, revealing the names of, of those if you do forget to um, check the box, so don't worry too much. 
So let me, uh, without further delay, introduce um, our speakers. Our first speaker is Hanneke Skapjonka. Uh, she is an endowed professor in clinical psychology of religion in Amsterdam and rector of the Center for Research and Innovation of Christian Mental Healthcare in the, in the Netherlands. As psychologist and theologian, her research interests include God representations and mental health, religion, suicidality, and interactions between religious factors and psychotherapy. She conducted two empirical studies on autism and God representations. Her current research focuses on self-compassion, religion, and mental health. Her 2019 inaugural address outlined the contours of a contemporary clinical psychology of religion with a focus on recovery, hope and compassion. And her contribution this morning will be from a psychological perspective. Whilst I'm here, I'll introduce uh, Hans Schaefer also. Uh, Professor Schaefer is married, they have one child. After serving as a pastor for eight years, he returned to the academy where he is currently Professor of Practical Theology at Theological University Campen and Vice Director of the Centre for Church and Mission in the Rest. He has written many articles and several books on ecclesiology, liturgy and practical theology. His main concern is with ecclesial practices in the broadest sense of the word, Autism, disability, theology are important as one of the many challenges churches in the West face today. It is these areas in which churches can make a difference by the grace of God. So there's a little bit of, uh, of background on our speakers today um, and written accounts of that are available on the website um, if you wanted to have another look. So without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Hanika uh, for her, her talk. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Denise, for introducing me and for um, uh, chairing this session. And um, um, very uh, many thanks to the organization of this conference. I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak today and to share my research. And I will start with sharing my PowerPoint. My topic for today is autism and God representations. And God representations um, are a core concept within psychology of religion. When you know who God is to a person or what the divine means to him or her, then you know um, an essential part of religious life and you can understand um, the religious behavior of the individual. And uh, you gain, uh, you have insight into why this person prays or doesn't pray, or why he or she goes to church or does not. And because the core concept, uh, the, the God representation as a core concept, uh, reflects the personal meaning of God to the individual. So it's not um, the beliefs of the church, it's not the, the convictions of the religious community, but it's a very personal. Um, a representation of uh, how this person perceives um, his or her uh, relationship with God. And uh, it reflects all the feelings and thoughts um, the person has in relationship to God. Let me introduce um, a few things about um, the development of God representations as uh, they are um, discussed by Anna Maria Risuto, uh, an important theorist of uh, this theme. In her view, the God representation comprises both a God image and a God concept. The God image is uh, the relational dimension of um, the God representation and it comprises the emotional understandings of God or the divine. And uh, in the interest of brevity, I will use the word God, but um, it also applies to um, understandings of the divine or a higher power or whatever. 
The God image develops uh, through a relational process and interactions with parents and significant others during um, an early stage of life are very important uh, for that because um, they result in um, a specific relational style or a way of being with others. Um, firstly, uh, the others in your family, but that relational style also functions as a, a template and a filter for future, future interactions and also for interactions with others um, and also uh, the interaction with God. The God image as the effective or emotional dimension uh, of the God representation uh, also functions as a filter um, in the appropriation of religious beliefs um, and religious convictions uh, that are communicated within the family, within the church, within the religious culture. So the God concept is uh, formed uh, through beliefs about God that are internalized uh, in a process of religious socialization. Annika, um, I think some people are struggling to see the PowerPoint. I was oh, really? uh, wondering um, if you are able to put it onto a uh, full full screen on um, slideshow. Um, uh, all we can see at the moment is uh, just your in initial opening slide. Okay, that's strange. Ah, that's um, better. That's better. And now I go to the third one. Um, this is the second one. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Yes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, um, when we uh, think about autism in the context of the development of God representations, uh, we can think about differences in social interactions. And because uh, these differences affect uh, people's relational style, uh, the way of being with others, it also affects uh, their God image. The same is true um, for the God concept. Uh, you can imagine that uh, the God concept and um, the formation of the God concept is um, affected or influenced by uh, differences in communication and imagination um, that are related with autism. Of course, uh, I can tell a, little, uh, a bit more about it, but um, I think we have not enough time to uh, discuss all uh, the implications and the detail, but feel free to um, ask a question about that or uh, bring it up uh, during the discussion. Uh, when we elaborate on the functioning of God representations um, and um, connect that uh, to the explanatory uh, models of autism, uh, then uh, the God representation is also um, a topic or, or um, uh, an issue uh, that is affected uh, by uh, autism. Um, the theory on a weak central coherence, I think most of uh, you know that theory, um, uh, predicts um, difficulties or differences in the integration of perceptions and experiences. Um, and of course, uh, that also um, affects uh, and uh, is relevant for uh, the perceptions and experiences that people have in relationship to God and how they represent that relationship. When generalizing is difficult, um, that's also um, uh, a thing that, that um, influences uh, how we think about God and how we um, experience God um, and the message about God as relevant for our own lives uh, in the present. Uh, think about um, reading a story in the Bible, a religious uh, narrative about God's actions in the past. Um, when that um, um, narrative is, uh, becomes meaningful uh, for your own life here and now, you should uh, generalize from the past to the present. And that could be uh, more difficult uh, for people on the spectrum than uh, for others. Focusing on uh, the theory of mind hypothesis, um, 
then uh, reflecting uh, on uh, the mind of God uh, could be um, more um, difficult for people on the spectrum. So reflecting on what does God want, what does God ask, uh, how does God feel, and so on. Um, of course, I know um, that uh, this hypothesis is uh, in discussion, and it's not uh, the only um, explanatory model for autism. Uh, but for now, um, I think these two um, uh, explanatory models help us to see uh, that uh, autism and God representation could be um, uh, uh, a difficult combination, although that's not the case for everybody, as uh, we will see. Um, from a theoretical point of view, you can have your hypothesis about uh, the God representations of um, people on the spectrum, but um, uh, it was quite strange for me to discover that um, people on the spectrum were not asked about their God representation themselves. Uh, at this time, when I started my data collection, uh, there was some empirical research on uh, religious belief and uh, God representations uh, among autistic people. But uh, then uh, relatives or friends or peers uh, had completed the questionnaires about religion for those people. And I think that's, that's not uh, a good idea, of course. Uh, instead, it's quite weird. So I started my uh, empirical, quantitative and qualitative uh, research um, among a Christian uh, group. Uh, which um, uh, received uh, guidance uh, uh, from a mental health um, institute. And um, uh, that resulted in a publication in uh, 2013. And after that, we did a follow-up study among uh, a more diverse group, and we compared uh, the God representations of autistic persons with anxious persons and uh, with controls. Let me present uh, the results of our first uh, study. Uh, we discovered that autistic persons reported less positive feelings towards God and that they experienced less support of God compared to those with other mental health conditions. And instead, they reported more anxiety and anger toward, toward God and they perceived God more as a judge and as a passive. So God uh, um, does nothing. Uh, to me, uh, God lets me do my own devices. That is the uh, experience of God's specificity. The more people reported autistic traits, the more experienced anxiety towards God, and the more they perceived God as a judge. And on an item level, we discovered that this anxiety to go towards God was mainly associated with uncertainty. So people felt quite uncertain uh, towards God and um, during the interviews they also told um, that they experienced high um, uh, um, uh, high, they, they received the high experiences and they felt that they um, uh, did not meet the norms uh, of others and that made them uh, uncertain and uh, some, some of them said well that's the same feeling I have in relationship towards God. We found also an association with religious background. Um, those who were orthodox reformed reported more anxiety. Um, and that type of anxiety was associated with guilt. So when you are on the spectrum and you have an orthodox reformed background or a strict Calvinist uh, background, and then you experience um, two types of anxiety. Uh, one uh, related to uh, your autism uh, and um, typ typified by uncertainty, and one um, uh, related to your religious background and typified uh, by guilt. Uh, at least this is the suggestion that uh, our results give. An important thing is the role of religion saliency. So the uh, extent to which religion is important for your daily life. And the more people reported religious saliency, the more they also reported positive aspects, uh, aspects of the God representation. 
So um, feelings of uh, support, uh, feelings of thankfulness, love, joy, and so on. And um, the positive aspects of God representations were present among these uh, participants. So although um, we found a relationship with uh, autism and anxiety towards God as our main finding, that does not mean that there were not uh, positive and supportive uh, aspects of the God representation. They were. Well, um, we thought, what about the two types of anxiety towards God? Was it only um, uh, a finding by chance, or could we um, uh, investigate that again and uh, confirm uh, these two types of anxiety? And in our 2021 uh, study, um, we also uh, found these two types uh, of anxiety. Um, the anxiety driven by guilt related to religious saliency and religious background, and the anxiety driven by uncertainty related to psychological distress. So once again, a comparable uh, distinction between these two types. Um, among this um, more diverse group with autistic, anxious uh, uh, persons, and uh, so the autistic persons, anxious persons, and controls, um, we found that. Uh, Aspects of God representations were mainly associated with religious saliency. So again, the extent or the degree to which religion is important to you is an important predictor for uh, your God representation. Mental health condition had no independent power to predict anxiety towards God. So that's a contradiction with our former findings. Uh, but personality traits had, and that was uh, the, the next step that we made in this um, uh, second study, we uh, investigated the temperament and character profile um, of the participants in relation to their code representations. And from the literature, we knew that uh, the temperament and character profile, uh, which is typical of um, autism, is characterized by high harm affordance, low reward dependence, low self directedness, low cooperativeness, high self transcendence. And three of these traits uh, we found to be related with the God representation in a way that um, uh, fits into uh, uh, the picture we have from the literature. So a lower uh, reward dependence is related to uh, less positive feelings towards God. Uh, a lower um, uh, self-directiveness is associated with higher anxiety towards God and more uh, perceptions of God's passivity and uh, uh, higher self-transcendence is related to higher feelings towards God. Of course, our um, studies have the limitations. Uh, the first thing is that uh, they are uh, cross-sectional studies and um, we need uh, longitudinal studies to um, see uh, relationships uh, over time and on my bucket list is a prospective study among uh, young people uh, to investigate how their um, God representation uh, develops, how their type of religiousness uh, develops in the context of autism, and what are predictors for specific types of God representations among uh, those young people on the spectrum. So maybe in the future I can uh, tell more about that. But for now, I think um, uh, that we have to do it with the limited uh, results we have, which point to um, the centrality or the saliency of religion as an important factor. And that's at the same time uh, a limitation of uh, uh, the studies uh, because they are not completely uh, comparable in terms of uh, centrality or saliency of religion. Uh, the former uh, group of participants uh, scored higher on religious saliency than the second one. And Stefan Huber, a German psychologist of religion, suggests that there is a quality leap between religious and highly religious persons. So uh, the associations between religion and mental health uh, may be different between the religious or the highly religious group. So that's an important thing to uh, uh, discuss, I think. Um, 
all the uh, participants um, uh, that were on the spectrum were uh, mostly men, but we know, of course, that uh, autistic um, women um, are uh, also uh, there, also uh, they are often underdiagnosed. So we do not know um, very much about their representation. They are underrepresented in our studies. The role of age is another factor to discuss, and we couldn't do, um, uh, we couldn't uh, make conclusions about that from our data. However, I think uh, the main findings are still valuable. And um, the, for me, the key topics are um, the focuses on uncertainty and the feeling of not being good enough, uh, which are, of course, um, the opposites of feeling certain and feeling uh, accepted. And here we find a correspondence between the social and the religious domain. Um, I uh, uh, told you already about uh, the communication of all our, of our participants about that, the example she gave. But uh, I think in general, um, these uh, uh, results on God representations reflect the correspondence between the social and the religious domain. So the high expectations that people experience in the social context are also uh, experienced in um, the religious context. And when we think about that about, uh, from a psychological perspective um, and know how important emotional experiences and personal interactions are for uh, these feelings, then there is a need for corrective emotional experiences in the present. I think. So um, when you want to contribute to um, a person's um, God representation, to, to put it very simply, um, you should not discuss or uh, teach or whatever, but you should interact uh, in such a way that um, the other person experiences certainty and acceptance. And then the correspondence uh, in between the social and the religious experiences could lead to a more uh, supportive and um, uh, good representation. Clear communication is also needed for the experience of certainty. Uh, you should know what is meant um, to feel certain. Maybe we can discuss that uh, in more detail later. For now, I will make uh, the step towards theological implication because certainty and acceptance are not only psychological concepts, but they also function within a theological context. Uh, think about the certainty of faith, securitists in Latin. And think about uh, unconditional grace as theological equivalent of um, acceptance uh, in a psychological context. And um, for me, and I think for other theologians as well, these concepts are core concepts uh, within a theology and within uh, the doctrine uh, about God. Uh, one more point. Um, in the um, debate about autism and the research about autism, um, we have observed a transition from deficiency to diversity, and that's a very good thing, of course. But I think uh, diversity is not the end stage in this context. I think we should uh, make a step further, uh, especially in the context of theology and church. Um, and what do I mean by that? I think God representations of um, people on the spectrum are not just um, showing variation, but they have a specific message and they make sure uh, the essence of faith, they, they make clear uh, the essence of faith. Um, uh, faith means uh, being sure and feeling certain about God, and faith means to. Um, feel and experience his unconditional grace and to know that you are accepted and loved by God. So um, because that, that notion um, is reflected in the God representation um, of uh, people on the spectrum, uh, that, carries uh, that carries obligations 
uh, towards the community. And uh, autistic people have something to declare and to share and to communicate in their own way. And uh, that's not an optional extra, but that's uh, the duty, uh, a service um, that builds uh, the community. So it's, it's about liturgy, about serving each other reciprocally um, and not uh, about free choice or a voluntary extra. Um, but declaration and duty are um, uh, specific, specifically uh, important in the context of theology and church and uh, people on the spectrum and other people, they need each other, uh, yeah, especially in the question about who is God and what does God mean to us today. Of course, I uh, can go further uh, on this theme, but uh, maybe Hans has more to uh, uh, tell us uh, about here. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Hanukkah. That was uh, really, uh, really interesting. And I was scribbling lots of notes um, and some comments and questions that have been coming in to uh, just to allow that to uh, to digest uh, a little and for allow, allow us to process or take a screen break. Um, I suggest that we take a, a five five minute break and if we come back together, um, well, it'll be a bit longer than um, five minutes. Let's go for a round number. Um, if we come back together at 11.40, so we have seven or eight minutes to uh, process what we've heard from Hanukkah. So we'll see you back here at 11.40. Uh, that was the uh, the words I was waiting to hear, recording in progress. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our respondent, Hans uh, Schaefer, uh, to give uh, his response to uh, Hanukkah's uh, talk. Um, Hans is having some issues with his PowerPoint. I'm, I'm sorry for the... Um, issues with powerpoints that we've been we've been having this morning but uh, hopefully you might be able to see uh hans powerpoint but you may not be able to see him um so i shall hand over hand over to you hans can you see my screen now yeah i can see your screen absolutely fine that's great, that's great. thank you so much uh, uh denise and uh, all the organizers for uh, having me on this um morning on autism and the and, and the church court representations and how to deal and, and cope with that. Thank you so much, Hanukkah, for your interesting and inspiring talk, sharing your research results with us. Um, we have talked through some issues already, and uh, I hope that we will really bring forth a kind of conversation now and that my response in some way really interacts with your concerns as well as your concerns interact with mine. I deliberately choose a, chose a, a small picture to illustrate what I'm talking about. Uh, in uh, Hanukkah's uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentation, we saw uh, candlelights. And I took this uh, image to continue that and then to highlight one of those candles. Uh, of course, we are, when we talk about autism, about being church, we're talking about uh, a circle of, of candles, a circle of light, a circle of flames. And uh, every one of those flames should be part of this circle, should integrate somehow. And the point is that that is not easy, not easy for none of us, I guess. I want to bring to the discussion a practical theological perspective. That is a perspective that is aiming at being church and what that brings for this. I have to admit that I have no special expertise in autism or uh, integrating people of difficult, uh, different backgrounds in different, different spectrums perhaps. Um, that's not my expertise. What I am concerned about is integration, inclusion, being church. And I have four points I would like to make. And the first is on, on what being church means, the second on inclusion, then about practicing and religious salience, and 
some concluding remarks. Um, yeah. First, a point I want to make is that when we talk about church, that we have to distinguish between a first order and a second order uh, discourse. The church, being church, participating in church as uh, believers or as guests or as whatever you are, uh, that is a first order uh, discourse. And when we reflect on this in practical theology, we talk about the second order discipline, ecclesiology. We reflect on what's going on in church practices. And that means that when we talk, when we talk about church, uh, we have to deal with real people. We are not talking about uh, stereotypes or, uh, or, or, or um, just uh, ideas. We are dealing with people, people who behave, who feel, who have feelings, who feel anxiety, uh, anxious, who uh, feel their anxiety towards God, who feel not accepted, perhaps. And uh, that is because we are a practicing community. Um, a practice community that does all kinds of things, whether liturgical things, diaconical things, in catechesis, in, in all kinds of ecclesial practices, we, uh, we participate. And those practices are not primarily expressively cognitive or effective, I would say. They are not first about stating uh, faith statements or about expressing feelings. And I think that's important to um, define this concept of practice very well, because that can make a kind of counterbalance in a culture that is focused on authenticity or expressivist ways of believing. Practicing faith is also about just doing things together. It is about rituals, about actions, the ritual of taking bread and wine, the ritual of baptism, those are the main, the main uh, church rituals, of course, but we're also very mundane actions taken as ecclesial practices. Um, for instance, someone lighting the uh, Advent candles in a church. In our churches, it's uh, common that little children do this and they sometimes take a word. And I once experienced um, uh, uh, a church service in which uh, a person with Down syndrome just lit that candle. And it somehow made clear that people with all kinds of abilities and disabilities should and can participate in doing things. And it's not necessarily something that is expressing some uh, statement of faith. It is being faith, embodying. My second point is about inclusion. Of course, Hanukkah poses a very interesting question about certainty and acceptance. How does church or can church enhance these uh, um, feelings, these uh, uh, characteristics? And I think that we should first of all say that it, the church can enhance these by putting God in the middle. God in his, um, in his self um, revelation to us. Um, because if God is in Christ, near, has come near to us, as we celebrate this Advent and Christmas time, then it makes sure that we can also be uh, uh, near to God. It is about... Uh, developing all kinds of practices in which mutuality and reciprocity within the community are valued and expressed and ex um, uh, also deliberately come to the fore as something that is uh, important for us as communities. So we do not talk about people, about autistic people, about whatever kind of people we are talking with and that also uh, is important in, in, in a church community. We do not talk about, we try to talk with. So that is about church. But then 
the second order discipline of theology or ecclesiology. As a second order reflective practices, we have to and should always try to reflect on what is usual, how people do things. Let me take one example. Uh, again, not from the autism spectrum, but a, 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 a person with a syndrome of Down, a young child, part of our community, uh, or he, he, the family uh, came into our uh, community and we tried to figure out how to deal with this young boy. He was about eight, eight, nine years old when he came. And we really tried to give him a space. We have this uh, a habit of gathering all the children during the church service together and have a kind of moment for the children. And he was part of it. He was behaving uh, not in the what we call normal sense of the way and um, people really upset about his behavior. So we said, well, that's not what, what it should be. That's not feeling, uh, uh, makes it comfortable for him, neither for his parents nor for the community. So we have to do something about it. We have to, reverse the idea of what is strange or what is uh, uh, unusual and rethink this practice of our child moment from the margins like Maria does in, his, in her uh, Magnificat. And then the, the whole process of the child moment was turned upside down. It was not about children behaving like, well, we should they think that she, they should behave but we should reflect on what's going on. We should talk about it with people and then design even perhaps new ways of doing a thing like this. So this theological reflection on what's going on is very important to make transformation possible. And in a way, this reflection, theological reflection is part of the practice itself. We can discuss that in a perhaps even, but that's for me very important. It's part of the practice to reflect. And that is what we have to reflect on how and why we should include people of different kinds. Why should we form a kind of community and put this circle of flames together? And that is um, what theological salvation is about. Salvation of, and, uh, of individuals, but also of the community. Now about practice. ASD, says Hanukkah in her uh, statement and in her research, increases feelings of uncertainty and uh, not being good enough. And religious saliency, on the other hand, says that you should, uh, that taking part in practices, taking part in practices of church helps. And that coincides with modern theories of religion as practice, more practice approached rather than discourse. Religion is much more than a cognitive discourse. It is a practice. So we have to develop and can develop all kinds of practices in a broad palette, not only the rituals in a liturgy, but also um, um, bringing around the church uh, journal or whatever you call it, the church, the, the booklet uh, uh, or something by all kinds of people can participate in these kinds of practices. They need reflection. Uh, and that is important in a uh, um, religiously illiterate uh, context. But also we have to state that rituals it's, themselves are important in uh, societies and contexts in which people are uh, increasingly religiously unsourced. They do not have the access to sources of rituals, and we have to provide both as churches. Some remarks. When talking about autism and church, I think we should say the first church and uh, should be God-centered. If God in his self-revelation is at the center, that really helps uh, us to, to confront ourselves with who we are in relation to him. This church is practice shaped, not primarily by discourses, but by practices based on communities, living together with all our differences and aiming at transformation, both of our 
individual lives and as our communal lives, it is aimed at transformation towards the goal God has set for us. Because practical ecclesiology is about transformation of the practices of the church. And that's my final word. In this process of transformation, mutuality and reciprocity with all people within the church, whether we call them disabled or not, whether they are in whatever kind of spectrum or not, is so important. And only then Mary's Magnificat can really uh, become, uh, become true by God's grace. Thank you so much for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hans, for um, your uh, response. Um, I'd like to hand back to uh, Hanukkah to um, hear any uh, thoughts and responses you, you have in response to Hans. Yes, thank you, Radhanisa. And thank you, Hans, for uh, this uh, response. I um, really appreciate it, um, especially how you um, uh, stress and underline uh, the importance of practice. Um, so practicing faith as um, a core notion in uh, the religious life of the community. Uh, we are also practicing community in uh, that way. Uh, and I think that that highlights the importance of behavior. Uh, as social scientists, um, we uh, often uh, uh, think about uh, what do people feel, what do they experience, um, uh, what do they uh, think, so cognitions, emotions are very important constructs. But of course, um, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and um, uh, the uh, actual behavior um, is very uh, uh, important to, to show and, and it, it reflects uh, what people uh, think and do. Um, in, in, in essence, uh, because we all know that uh, there is social desirability. You can say, well, this is what I believe, but uh, your beliefs uh, become um, visible in, uh, your, um, in your deeds, in your behavior. And of course, um, uh, the other way around, uh, behavior is formative um, for um, uh, thoughts and feelings. And uh, that's a, a very crucial notion, uh, I think. Uh, and in this way, religious uh, behavior uh, within the community is formative for uh, court representation as well. Um, so um, how we do this together um, is, of, is, is a bifocal thing. Um, and I think it's also helpful um, in the context of uh, uncertainty, um, uh, experience, uh, high expectations, and so on. So when certainty and acceptance are issues at stake, or certainty and grace, um, the rituals of the community and um, practicing faith uh, together could be a way to find certainty and uh, to, to uh, find a feeling of uh, acceptance, because you do it together and you belong to it uh, together. And um, communication um, uh, through the rituals, uh, through uh, the re religious behavior is also formative for community, for experiencing community. So, um, well, I think uh, you made a valuable um, um, response in this context and uh, uh, it deserves more attention also in the research of uh, social scientists, not only uh, um, the theologians, uh, which are the practical theologians, that are um, interested in uh, the practice of faith. Um, so that's one um, response on your talk. Um, the other one is, um, well, as a, as a psychologist of religion, I only um, examine and study uh, the God talk of people. So what do people uh, share themselves about uh, their feelings, their thoughts towards God, uh, maybe their behavior towards God. Um, but a theologian also reflects on uh, the God talk of people um, and uh, the concrete behavior of, uh, of people in relationship uh, to the God of 
uh, the Christian tradition, uh, the God of the Bible. Um, so the, your God-centered approach um, is very important, I think. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, putting an emphasis on that. Um, because um, uh, I recognize um, yeah, how, how the, the, the center, uh, the focus on God um, is um, inspiring uh, your own birth. It's, it's uh, also the reason that I um, combine the psychological implications uh, with uh, the theological ones and uh, turn uh, towards the concepts of certainty and grace in a theological sense. And your um, um, focus on uh, transformation, uh, well, that underlines uh, my own um, statement about uh, declaration and duty, I think. So um, um, uh, the, the status quo um, is not uh, the ideal status. And um, the kingdom of God is, is, uh, is not, it, it is here, but it's not here in all its richness. And we could help each other uh, to experience more of God and uh, his kingdom um, uh, with um, an attitude uh, that makes a transformation uh, possible. Uh, maybe it, uh, this is enough for now, and uh, I uh, look towards Denise and yes, there she is, uh, because I look forward to the discussion uh, with the participants, so I don't want to uh, say too much uh, in the spare time we have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you both, both of you uh, for a uh, fabulous uh, opportunity for discussion. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in um, already, but if uh, anybody else would like to uh, pose questions, please do so in the uh, Q&A uh, box below. Um, and if you have a comment to make, uh, do uh, highlight that it's uh, a comment and also um, whether you are happy to share your comment uh, with, the, with the wider group, um, if you could put that um, happy to share. Um, just at the end of your comment as well, and then it'll save some, a little bit of behind the scenes work. Um, the first question I want to pick up on, um, and I think it'll, it'll end up being for both uh, you, Hanneke, and uh, Hans. Um, question, and it's the question uh, for the moderators behind the scenes at 11.29. Um, is it more natural for people with uh, autism to form a representation of a God who is incarnate in the human person of Jesus rather than of an incorporeal transcendent being? And then the second part of that question was, does iconography play any significant role in the formation of these representations? Yes, it's, it's a question to both uh, Hans and to me, uh, you said? Yes. Okay, um, shall I start uh, and then uh, you can continue Hans? Yeah. Um, uh, well, I think um, uh, in my research, in my uh, social scientific research, um, the uh, uh, concept of um, God representations is is operationalized as uh, feelings towards God and uh, thoughts about uh, the actions of God or the power of the divine. Um, so it's not um, uh, de designed uh, from um, uh, a theistic um, uh, concept, uh, conceptualization of a God representation. And when people um, uh, continue the question, uh, complete the questionnaire and um, um, uh, report their feelings towards uh, God or the divine or uh, a higher power. Um, that, that, it, that reflects their feelings um, um, uh, that dominate their relationship. Uh, so it's, it's in the design of the study, uh, both uh, theistic and um, uh, other uh, God representations are um, possible. But when you think about this um, on a more theoretical level, and then of course um, the religious community is quite formative um, and um, uh, issues are like uh, incarnation or uh, an incorporeal transcendent being 
uh, kan het uh, steek. Um, so I think um, the specific uh, group of participants uh, makes a, a difference here. Uh, in my former study, um, um, all the participants belong to a Protestant church and um, most of them to uh, uh, a church in which um, uh, the incarnation um, of God in Christ uh, is a very important thing. But when we um, ask questions about God, um, my idea is uh, that they think more often about God and uh, uh, less often about uh, Jesus. But that's also um, the reason uh, that uh, we prefer uh, mixed uh, method studies um, so that we can ask about people's own words and uh, about God and their own uh, ideas and beliefs about who is God. Um, I know that there um, is a, a Scandinavian study in which um, the concept of God is more uh, diverse and uh, it's about superhuman agents and, uh, and then um, uh, the researchers find different uh, results um, also in terms of interacting uh, with uh, a god or angels or whatever in an uh, imaginative way. Uh, regarding your question about iconography, um, of course uh, that can play an important role. Um, although here in the Netherlands we have um, more orthodox churches uh, which um, have forbidden to uh, make pictures of Jesus or pictures of God in uh, children's Bibles, for example. So um, there's a kind of a, a void, uh, iconography uh, lacks, and that could complicate um, this, uh, this matter, I think. Maybe you have um, more things to say about the tents? Well, uh, just a few uh, things, because you answered very well, I guess. Um, trying to investigate this uh, uh, issue of God representations on people, uh, autistic people, within different uh, churches should be very interesting because uh, they uh, surely have different ways of, of formation of people. So uh, there are traditions in which uh, um, icons play uh, in, in any way a, a bigger role than in other traditions, and that may or may not uh, uh, influence also people with, with autism. Um, I think, however, that it is, uh, of course, we can research how the differences are and come about. But what is so important for me is that any church from whatever tradition should say, well, we should be open for a kind of transformation on this. So if we are used to certain image or not using certain images, we should really ask uh, what is helping others to build a trusting relation in, in an environment of certainty and, and grace with God. And whatever is needed to bring this about should be used by the church. And then uh, in, uh, stress, stressing uh, the incarnate son of God, uh, maybe of help, but in, in other traditions when uh, uh, perhaps less, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure that that is the solution for every church tradition. Yes, and um, in line with this, uh, my personal conviction is that uh, we need uh, God representations um, from all kinds of people and from all kinds of churches um, in order to, um, to know as far as we can uh, who God is. So uh, knowing God uh, has to do with um, uh, communicating uh, representations of God, who is God to you, who is God to me, and um, in that way we um, can um, uh, come to a richer understanding of God, because um, I always say in simple terms, uh, God is too big to, to uh, fit in my own head, uh, God is always larger, so we, therefore we need each other, and, and that was exactly the reason that I uh, uh, chose the, the picture uh, of the candles uh, because uh, for me the candle uh, symbolizes uh, an individual believer but uh, on its own it's all it's very weak and um, uh, in order to uh, to shine the light uh, all the candles are needed 
Yes, indeed. I, I liked that uh, that image of the candle in it. It leaves a big gap if one of the candles is, is missing or, um, or not. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, lead, leading on from um, that that point, um, a question came in at eleven thirty five um, of uh, do different traditions make it harder or easier to have a positive idea about God? Um, because in the question um, askers experience, they felt that it did. First, yes, I think really it, it does, of course, make a difference in what tradition you are formed and raised. Uh, and uh, it's harder to uh, uh, experience grace or certainty in certain religious contexts. That is uh, evident. Uh, and that is, um, but I don't know whether that has been researched. And that is uh, Hanukkah's uh, portion, perhaps. Yes, as in our uh, empirical research, um um, uh, we, we, we see differences in um, uh, specific uh, traditions. In um, my 2000, 2008 article about God representations, um, I had a figure in which uh, differences between Roman Catholics, uh, mainline Protestants, uh, conservative uh, Protestants, and uh, evangelical and Baptist uh, participants are um, uh, shown. Um, so yes, there are different uh, there are differences, and I think, uh, but that's a, a normative theological um, remark um, that uh, some um, um, denominations uh, make it more difficult to experience uh, what you um, called a trusting relationship with God. Uh, Hans. Um, I do a lot of my research within the context of uh, Christian mental health care. And um, uh, many of our participants that belong to uh, strict Calvinistic churches uh, report uh, feelings of um, uh, anxiety, fear, uh, anger, um, guilt, shame. Um, and, and the message they hear within their churches is not the message of a God that unconditionally loves us. Uh, they, uh, because um, uh, the, the, the salvation is only for a small group and they feel quite uncertain um, uh, if they belong to that group that will be saved. Um, so that, that's a very difficult thing. And um, uh, yeah, when, when you are raised in, in such a context and uh, you are on the spectrum, uh, it can become uh, more, even more difficult when uh, certainty and um, unconditional acceptance are important issues for you. So sometimes I become a bit sad about that, um, but at the same time, it motivates me to uh, make small steps and to make connection even um, with those groups and to uh, uh, to to. Uh, contribute to their transformation, although <laughs> my uh, possibilities are very limited, of course. I just add one thing, because I think this is very important for any tradition, because every tradition has its own one-sidedness. And in every, uh, um, that is why we need uh, um, bringing about and listening to the different voices that are part of this community. Um, there is this theoretical model of, uh, of Helen Cameron and uh, Claire Watkins on the four voices of theology, and that is very helpful in establishing those different voices within the community and, and bring them into a mutual uh, uh, conversation with one another. So hearing the theological voice, hearing what people do, what people think, what people are inclined to, to believe, that is really helpful if that is brought into a, a, a discussion within any church community, I think. Yes, and, and um, I think that who we are as persons uh, with our um, life story, with our psychological makeup, uh, always interact with the message that is communicated within uh, our uh, uh, specific uh, denomination or a specific group. And um, then um, yeah, we can uh, um, observe um, interactions that are uh, unhealthy or that, that hinder uh, people or hamper them uh, in their uh, uh, trusting relationship with God. 
so um sort of following on from that i um have uh another question from uh for two questions for for Hanukkah, but again um hands feel free to um comment as well um, and it's the the question at uh the anonymous question at midday um, so the first question uh, to Hanukkah was, did any of your participants relate their experiences explicitly to any theories of autism? If yes, which? Um, and secondly, could you say a bit more about how anxiety was identified in your studies? Was it linked to identification with a specific term in Dutch? And if yes, is that relevant to interpretation of the results? Um, and a, a comment behind that was um, the question asker was curious about whether there can ever be a positive role for something similar to anxiety and uncertainty in the development of relig religious beliefs. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this question. And of course, uh, uh, all the participants who um, share the questions and remarks, um, uh, thank you for that. Um, um, about uh, the uh, first question uh, on uh, theories of autism, um, we designed our studies uh, as open as possible. And uh, we just informed um, the participants uh, that we would like to hear uh, who God uh, is uh, to uh, him or her um, and, and to know um, yeah, who are you. Uh, so we didn't um, uh, discuss uh, explanatory models uh, or theories on autism. Um, so um, um, in our, in, in our quantitative part, uh, the uh, participants uh, couldn't share their experiences um, uh, with theories. In the qualitative part, um, let me think. It's a few years ago, of course, so I'm not, I have not a, a clear example from that. Uh, but um, there are two um, uh, memories uh, pop up now. Um, the first thing is that one of the participants said, but that's that's more on uh, on normativity and uh, on the uh, uh, perspective of deficiency. Um, uh, that uh, uh, he said, well, uh, I believe in a different way uh, than uh, you should do. So please learn me how to believe as you do. And that touched me uh, because I thought, well, that that isn't a norm in my um, um, view, in my opinion. Um, you can uh, teach me uh, as much as I can teach you. And um, uh, yeah, we should really move from thinking in terms of deficiency uh, to uh, diversity and so on. So that, that's one example of uh, at least a specific uh, perspective on, on autism. Um, and the other uh, memory um, that I remember now is that the first uh, five people I interviewed um, said in their own words, well, um, if God uh, hasn't been there, I would have been here uh, uh, now because they all had their uh, suicidal periods. So um, that also um, yeah, reflected to me uh, the relevance and importance of uh, 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 giving voice uh, to uh, uh, those people to people on the spectrum. A second question about uh, how we um, uh, operationalized anxiety. Um, in my research, I uh, mostly used the questionnaire God representation, which uh, uh, was originally uh, developed by uh, Sebastian Murken in Germany. And um, um, the elegance of that questionnaire is um, that it's very short in um, mentioning um, feelings towards God. So it's uh, simply thankfulness or love or um, uh, guilt or um, whatever. Uh, 33 feelings in the long version of the questionnaire. And uh, we have the, and, and I think that's, that's the best way to study because it's the most easiest uh, thing and it uh, asks uh, 
and not so much interpretation from the participant. Um, the subscale on anxiety uh, has the Dutch um, uh, word angst. So it's, it's very close in uh, the sound to anxiety. Um, and it measures uh, anxiety um, of being not good enough, of being punished, of being um, no, another, another type of uh, guilt and uncertainty. Um, and I think the, the choice for the, the word angst is better than the Dutch word for um, um, fear. Uh, that's that's praise in Dutch. Um, because um, when you um, uh, mention the positive role uh, for something similar to anxiety developing religious belief, um, that reminds me uh, on Rudolf Otto and his ideas about um, um, das Heilige, uh, the Holy. Um, and he says, well, that's a, a mystery uh, to be feared, and it's a mystery um, uh, that fascinates. And uh, in that way, uh, a fear could be re related to all. Um, and and um, uh, fear could have a positive connotation, but I think anxiety has a more negative, uh, uncertain, and even undermining uh, connotation. Very briefly, just uh, the positive notion of anxiety already imagine, uh, uh, highlighted by you by uh, mentioning Otto and, and others. Uh, that is also part, of course, if we, if we um, uh, raise children, any child has to learn some kind of uh, uh, uneasiness with its own behavior. Uh, if if he or she is hitting someone, we can't say, well, that's, that's good, that, just, just try. So there has to be kind of corrected. The transformational aspect of it also involves a kind of uncertainty. The problem is not that it should involve some kind of uncertainty or anxiety. The problem is that it should be embraced by a, a, an atmosphere of uh, grace and acceptance. And within a kind of complete atmosphere of acceptance, feelings of anxiety can and shall uh, pop up sometimes. And I, I'm sure that's not only just a practical thing, but that's also theoretically very true. Yes, and it even um, has to do with a psychological maturity that you can uh, endure the, the feelings of uneasiness um, in combination with feelings of acceptance, of love, and so on. So, so the balance between the two uh, is very important. And your um, 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 uh, capacity to tolerate uh, um, ambivalence uh, and to integrate opposi opposing uh, feelings, uh, that, that's a very important thing in, in your psychological development. But also, it's I think it's, um, important uh, in the towards in the relation uh, towards God. So, in terms of God representations, uh, that they are not uh, one-sided toward all positivity and love, and uh, God is only accepting you uh, at one hand, and at the other hand, that they are, are not, um, yeah, unbalanced because uh, all the emphasis is on God's judgment, for instance. Super, thank you. And I, I think that um, li links in with, with another question that may have partly already been answered um, in um, what you've just said, but I'll, I'll read it out um, anyway, just to scoop up anything that was missed. Um, so it's the, the question, uh, the anonymous question at 1210. Um, Hanukkah, I found your connections to guilt and not feeling good enough really helpful and actually quite transformative for me. Uh, so a question for both of you, um, if this is, as your research suggests, common in religious autistic people, I wonder how we can perhaps more successfully talk about sin and confession in our churches in a way that doesn't, as it often has for me, create repetitive cycles and fixation on failings that become barriers to participation, especially if we couple that with autistic trauma. Oh, wow, great point, thank you. 
Um, uh, in this, this context, um, it's helpful um, for me to differentiate between uh, brokenness, um, sin, and um, being captured. And uh, those three categories, um, I, I borrow from um, the Lord's Prayer, um, because in the second part of the Lord's Prayer, we, we pray um, to uh, the God, um, we, we pay as, as uh, creations of God towards uh, our Creator. And when we pray for our daily bread, um, we uh, pray for forgiveness uh, for our sins as, as people who are guilty and uh, to the God uh, who forgives. And um, um, we um, pray for liberation um, of evil um, as, as persons that are captured and then need uh, that liberation uh, from uh, our mighty God. Uh, and that differentiation helps me to uh, speak about sin, uh, because uh, sometimes um, um, I have the impression that uh, we call things sin uh, that that are really uh, that that are not really sins, um, but that they are um, uh, results of brokenness, uh, of being uh, uh, a human uh, person. Uh, with limited capacities, just because you are a human person, you are not a divine person. Um, so you have to deal um, with limitations, with uh, disease, um, with disability, and, and all the things we have uh, to cope with as human beings. Um, and sometimes our limitations uh, could lead to sin. But that's not all, all, always uh, the case, I think. And uh, I think it's, it's helpful um, when we are more aware of the differentiation. Um, yes, the, the, the word trauma um, also um, uh, reminds me of, of a woman uh, with a, a history of... Um, um, emotional abuse and uh, she's become uh, a person that's not um, that made some some uh, wrong choices for instance uh, because she never learned to say no um, and well I think that that's not only sin to make the wrong choice it's also the brokenness and the result of uh, an upbringing with um, uh, parents without uh, who did not provide clear and healthy uh, limits, for example. Um, so yes, I think um, that we could uh, talk about sin and confession in a better way. Uh, also, um, because not everything that seems to be sin is really sin. Um, that, that's one perspective on this question. I, I'm aware that there are a lot of perspectives that are relevant in this context, but maybe uh, you have one, uh, Hans. I think it's, uh, uh, first of all, a magnificent explanation on one of the core texts of Christian faith, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and that really ties it together that in inhabiting these um, practices, these texts that you pray and you use, like the Psalms, etc. There is a kind of broad spectrum of uh, characterizations of the relationship with God that you can uh, reflect on. It's not just one state of fallenness, of sin, or it's, it's all kind of different aspects. And it's very helpful to um, sort out what differences there are in this respect. And um, that sometimes borders between categories may be crossed as well. If I feel uh, trapped in the realm of evil that can cause me to do sin, whether I am uh, uh, in, whatever, uh, uh, in whatever spectrum I, I can function. Also for autistic people as well, they, they can be called sinners in a, certain, in a certain way. And the point is that you have to know how we react on such a statement. And if that causes 
high levels of raised uncertainty, then we should first of all stress this uh, embrace of love and grace in which we can really talk within a trusting relationship about what things bring to others and do to others and how this affects even, even God. And then we can de, um, decrease the, uh, the enormousness of sin to some, uh, in some experiences and say, well, of course you sin. Well, as one of the uh, Dutch uh, theologians once said, to, to be called a sinner is a, is a magnificent issue because it makes you uh, a kind of, in, in a way, autonomous for ruler. And he said, uh, if you, you're a sinner, it, it, you're, you can be um, make, made accountable for it sometimes. And that is also a very helpful point in establishing a more mature faith. So to be called a sinner is not only a bad thing, it's also made, it also makes it possible to reflect on your deeds, etc. So within a trusting environment, this concept, even this concept, can be uh, helpful if we have the, the correct uh, sub this, uh, um, diversifications. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can I say something more, Denise? Because yeah, I see in, the minute, chat, yeah. in the chat, I see uh, a very um, um, nice suggestion uh, about uh, confessing with a, a trusted friend um, to mitigate repetitive cycles and fixation. And um, um, I think that that's um, something uh, autistic people can learn uh, to people who are not on the spectrum. Um, yeah, well, when, when, when there is, uh, is sin and you confess and you forgive each other, when then, well, then it's, then it's over. So that's, that's um, a practice um, that provides a certainty. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's okay now. Uh, we have dealt with it and uh, now it's, uh, it's the past and, and, and we live in the present. Um, and in, in that way, um, we, we could um, transform um, to um, a better understanding uh, and a better, um, uh, maybe even a better worshipping of uh, forgiveness uh, because uh, sin and confession uh, are not the end points. Uh, we live from forgiveness and we live for forgiveness, I think. Thank you. Uh... It's been a, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, I'm sorry for the questions that um, we we didn't get um, around to. We, we, there was uh, plenty more in the, the Q and A box. But thank you uh, both to Hanneke and to Hans for um, your your talks, your feedback, and your um, your your discussion. I I found it uh, very very interesting. Uh, thank you also to our BSL interpreters uh, for signing this session um, and to all those busy working uh, behind uh, the, the scenes. Uh, the Wonder Room um, is, is now open um, and you can join that. Um, Rachel has put that in the, the link so it's easier uh, in the chat box, the link in the chat box so it's easier for you to find it. Uh, we just ask that you uh, log out of Zoom uh, after you've logged in so you've not got both running at the same time but uh, that's all uh, for, for me um, I uh, look forward to uh, our, our next session at um, I think it's at one o'clock thank you yes thank you very much Denise and uh, thank all of you um, for participating and uh, uh, for giving us the chance to, to share our thoughts with you is it 1 30 so the next session? Sorry, that was my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Hans. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. And the next session is at 1 30. Take care, everybody. Yeah, thank you.